Hello, it's Scott Madley here. On my previous video about the Polaris missile, I realized that there was an important piece of NASA history, which I have barely mentioned over my many years talking about rockets. Yeah, I've talked about the various rockets that NASA has used over the uh, years, um, you know, Delta, Titan, Atlas, Saturn, but I have barely mentioned one rocket which launched over a hundred times, launched more than Saturn 1 and Saturn 5 put together, and it has quite a close relationship to the Polaris missile. I am, of course, talking about the Scout rocket, a rocket that was developed in the early 1960s. It was a small sat launcher which used four stages of solid rocket motors, and it was mostly developed by NASA in close collaboration with industry. The development of Polaris showed that you could have large solid rocket motors and there's a lot of heritage between Polaris and the first stage motor of the Scout, which is the Algol. The Scout was conceived by engineers at Langley Research Centre, which was one of the biggest research centre for NACA, the National Advisory Council for Aeronautics. They focused on aviation. They had the world's biggest and best wind tunnels. Langley was founded in 1917 as the US entered the First World War and realized that most of its military aircraft couldn't compete with European counterparts. And over the years, their capabilities improved. They moved from subsonic through transonic into supersonic regime. They were instrumental in developing the X-1. But as speeds increase, it gets harder and harder to test this in a wind tunnel. So instead, the engineers could fly test hardware, test items on rockets. There was a group at Langley known as the Pilotless Aircraft Research Division who had been working on these kind of systems. They had been building sounding rockets initially out of military missiles and then assembling them into multi-stage vehicles. They had set records on how fast they could send their rockets. With these capabilities, it was easy to get above the Kármán line and into space, but by the mid-1950s, the engineers began to wonder whether they could actually reach orbital velocity, when of course Sputnik happened. And suddenly these engineers' back-of-envelope calculations became a way of competing in the space race, and Scout was born. There are some sources that say that SCOUT is an acronym of a Solid Controlled Orbital Utility Test, but as far as we can tell, this is a backronym with the only appearing in later uh, you know, documents. The team had already been building high-performance sounding rockets by taking various solid rocket motors which had been developed for other projects and bolting them together into large multi-stage monstrosities which could reach extreme speeds. SCOUT would just be taking this to the next level. The first stage of the Scout was based on the Jupiter Senior. This was a, an aerojet-built booster that was supposed to take the liquid-fueled Jupiter rocket and shrink it down using solid propellant so that it could be a viable submarine-launched missile. Aerojet took the Jupiter Senior casing and replaced the propellant with the higher-performing propellant used for Polaris and christened it Algol. It would be about 11 tons and generate 45 tons of thrust for about 40 seconds. The second stage would be based on the existing Sargent missile, but again having a new propellant formulation. The stage would be renamed the Castor. It would be about 4.5 tons and generate 25 tons of thrust. The third and fourth stages were both based on the X-248, which was the third stage of the Vanguard rocket. The fourth stage was just the stock X-248, but the third stage would be in a large version called the X-254. The third stage would be christened Antares, and the fourth would be called Altair. Working together, these four rockets could deliver maybe 130 pounds, 160 kilograms into low Earth orbit. Of course, there's more to building a rocket than simply bolting a bunch of uh, rocket stages together. First stage steering was performed by a combination of fins that would extend out into the airflow and vanes that would extend back into the rocket exhaust. The second and third stage would use hydrogen peroxide uh, monopropellant thrusters. And the fourth stage would be spin stabilized. The fully assembled rocket would be 25 meters or 82 feet tall. The first test launch was 18th of April 1960. It was a Scout X, which only had operational first and third stages, but otherwise was going to test much of the vehicle hardware. The first four-stage version of Scout flew on July 1st, 1960. While it was primarily intended to be a test of the rocket, it also carried a live payload which was supposed to detect radiation in space. 
This launch took place from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia, and initially the launch went very well. The first couple of stages performed as expected. The third stage, however, experienced some vibration, and this caused the hydrogen peroxide roll jets to misperform. The vehicle rolled by about 270 degrees before correcting itself. The ground tracking system noticed the roll and it interpreted this as the vehicle going off course. The range control safety officer decided that they would suppress the ignition of the fourth stage and that meant that they had basically aborted a perfectly good launch. So with the data from the first flight, they went back to the drawing board, they fixed the issues that they had encountered and they began to plan the second launch, which would be in October 1960. This was going to carry a radiation probe, again, in a suborbital mission. Even though it was using the full rocket, these were intentionally suborbital launches. The second launch was a success and the payload reached an altitude of 5,600 kilometers and the Scout was declared operational. But this may have been somewhat premature because the next launch carrying Explorer S-56 didn't get anywhere near orbit due to the second stage failing to light. While the next launch, carrying essentially the same payload named Explorer 9, would successfully make it to orbit. Out of the next five launches, two of them would fail. It wasn't having a great time. And one problem laid with the stage separation system. So Scout had been designed around uh, hot staging as a concept, which uh, gives me an excuse to play this footage while I explain that hot staging is where you light the upper stage engines, release the clamps, and allow the spacecraft to move apart using their own power. But Scout took this a little further. Instead of having a, an independent system that would release the mechanism securing the stages together, they would have these diaphragms that were structurally linked to the, the clamps. And when the engine fired, it would blow apart this structure, releasing the stages, effectively driving the separation mechanism using the rocket engine. I like to call this hotter staging. So this actually worked pretty well for the first few stages because the mass of the stages was pretty high. It had a lot of inertia. It kept the thing pointing in the correct direction. But for the final stage, it, in it frequently knocked the stage out of attitude. And because it was spin stabilized, it wouldn't correct and ended up uh, in the wrong orbit. So they replaced the hotter staging system with a more traditional system based on latches and springs, and uh, that improved things. But it didn't solve all the problems. They did keep on having failures at a pretty high rate. In 1961 and 62, approximately one third of the launches failed in some way. Scout had been put together very quickly and frequently the teams working on the ground came up with unorthodox solutions to solve the problems and get the vehicles launched. And these problems with the Scout's low reliability would eventually come to a head in June of 1963. It was supposed to be a suborbital launch, but it was a bit more suborbital than they had hoped. Just a few seconds after leaving the pad, a burn through was witnessed at the bottom of the rocket. So the casing, the nozzle had failed, the chamber had failed, and uh, the rocket started to consume itself. Very quickly, the entire rocket ended up disintegrating. And as it disintegrated over the uh, launch area, it would scatter lots of burning solid rocket propellant over the surface. And this stuff, of course, cascaded down, started fires. And in one case, a chunk fell through the roof of one of the buildings, which happened to have somebody's nice sports car in it. And I don't know whose car that was, but I think they might have had some influence because this incident brought the whole program to a halt. And they had to go back and prove that their rocket was successful and good and safe and they began investigating whether there was some common problem behind all the failures and what they found out was actually no every failure they've had at scout was down to some other system right there was no single problem that could be responsible for all the different failures they were seeing instead the problem lay with the ground teams and so rather than fix a couple of things, they went back, they sent all the rockets back to the factory, had them all stripped down, verified and checked. They wrote copious documentation, standardizing all the ground procedures, standardizing equipment between the launch sites. And starting mid-1964, they went two and a half years without a single failure. Which was good because this was around the time that Scout began launching payloads for other countries as part of you know, diplomatic deals. Uh, they launched the Ariel satellites for the United Kingdom. They launched um, San Marco for Italy. There was a satellite for France called 
France won, and a more general European satellite for the European uh, Space Research Organization. And the collaboration with Italy took Scout in an entirely new direction, specifically to the equator just off the coast of Africa. There were a handful of scientific satellites which could really benefit from having a zero inclination orbit exactly over the equator. Italy had access to these uh, platforms off the coast of Kenya, and I guess one of the most important satellites that it uh, launched was the X-ray Explorer satellite, also known as Uhuru, the uh, Swahili word for freedom. So it launched from San Marcos and it enabled it to be in this zero inclination orbit to carry out its survey of the skies in X-rays. Another important collaboration on the Scout rocket was the US Air Force who built their own version, the Blue Scout. Actually, it was a collection of different versions. They would tend to mix and match the stages, mostly to perform suborbital missions, performing scientific tests of high velocities uh, you know, in the atmosphere. There was the Blue Scout 1, which eliminated the fourth stage, and there was the Blue Scout Junior, which eliminated the first stage. So as well as addressing the various reliability issues, the Scout would continue to evolve uh, technologically and expand its capabilities by implementing or adding in new uh, thrusters, new solid rocket motors. So like the very first X-1 variant that launched in 1960 could in theory put 131 pounds into orbit, but by the end of the 1960s we were looking at the B-1 variant which had 315 pounds into orbit. And by the time we got to the end of the 70s, we had the G1 version 458 pounds to orbit, and that would continue to fly through the 80s and into the 1990s. One of the payloads Scout regularly handled was the transit satellites, and these were sort of the predecessor to GPS, and they were used by the US nuclear missile submarines for navigation so that they knew where they were launching their missiles from because the accuracy of the missiles very much depended on the accuracy with which they knew the location of the launch site. And so that is the other link back to Polaris. The last NASA payload to fly was Explorer 60, or SAGE, in 1979. Of course, NASA was expecting that they would be flying all their future payloads on the space shuttle and wouldn't need a Scout anymore. But the Scout continued to fly, mostly launching payloads for the US Air Force, the last Italian launch from San Marco was 1988, and the very final launch of Scout was in 1994. The Miniature Seeker Technology Integration Satellite Number 2, built by JPL, but paid for and launched by the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization. Yes, this was a satellite that was developing the technology to detect missile launches so that they perhaps might be shot down by some future technology. But someone clearly thought that a small launcher powered by solid rocket motors was a good idea, and around the same time as uh, Scout was being retired, Orbital Sciences Incorporated were trying to build out the Pegasus launch vehicle. And before long, this evolved into the Taurus, which was a four-stage solid rocket-based orbital launch system. Also, the blueprint of building four-stage launchers using you know, off-the-shelf solid rocket motors is something that is very much alive in China right now, with a, more companies than I can count building their own version of these uh, launch vehicles from off-the-shelf solid rocket motors. And so while Scout doesn't fly anymore, and while a lot of people seem to forget that it even exists, it does have a substantial impact on modern spaceflight. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.